Your Honor. Yeah. Who's going to address that? I will address that, Your Honor. That you are? Danny Cho from the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. Very well. Her testimony is highly relevant. It is illustrative of much of the expert testimony that has come out. She also exemplifies some of the city's harm, showing the differences between how domestic partnership is treated versus marriage, and how marriage would generate far more revenue than domestic partnerships. With respect to the descriptions of her testimony, first of all, with respect to the documents on the messaging, these are all messages that she saw during the campaign for Proposition 8. These are all examples of incidents of discrimination that she experienced as a lesbian in California. And those are all clearly covered by the description of her testimony that we presented to the defendant interveners. Your Honor, I would uh, take issue with that description being consistent with what was just represented. But to the extent that this testimony is consistent with the ex expert testimony and to the prior testimony, it would certainly be needlessly, needlessly cumulative. We've had four experts testify to the history of discrimination, the distinction between domestic partnership and civil marriage, including the four plaintiffs. For one person taking in what is reality off the street to testify in this case as to her particular experience with those things is not relevant because she can't speak as an expert. She, has been, she hasn't been designated as such. Her opinion in regards to those things is also not probative in the fact of this case. And that's the standard for her testimony. Uh, and that's the standard for her testimony. It has, has to make a fact that this case either more likely or less likely. Her experience with discrimination or same-sex marriage is not probative of any fact in this case. Your Honor, if I could address that. In addition, the other important aspect of Ms. Zia's testimony is she has actually gotten married. And this whole case is about how marriage is going to change things for same-sex couples and enhance their relationships and enhance their relationships with their families. Here, she's a real-life example of that. And everything is sort of in theory. And what she is, is she demonstrates in fact that marriage does change things for people and it's very important to same-sex couples and it does indeed have a transformative effect. And there is nothing about that else in this case. And this bookends the plaintiffs who are telling you that they want to get married and these are the reasons why. Well, she's an exact example of what they're looking for. And in that respect, she adds an incredible amount of probative value to this case. Your Honor, not to belabor the point that that kind of evidence is the kind of evidence that is demonstrated through scientific and expert testimony. I mean, if the city would like to demonstrate that, then they should present a study with a reliable sample size of individuals that have experienced the things that Ms. Zia has experienced. So one, one single solitary individual to get up on the stand and te to testify in her, to her experiences can't possibly demonstrate what the experience of all the same-sex couples has been. It's not scientifically reliable. It's completely inappropriate in this context. Submitted. Uh, if I could just add one thing. No, submitted. Submitted. Sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> A little too anxious. I apologize. Experience counts. Thank you. One of the advantages of a bench trial is that evidence can be heard, its relevance and its weight can be considered and determined as the evidence is presented. And counsel for the defendant interveners has made arguments that the evidence that this witness is going to present is not relevant or of little weight. And that is certainly something that can be considered after the court has heard the evidence and evaluated it. Does appear from plaintiff counsel's representation the witness is going to speak to issues that have been raised in the case and which are important for the ultimate resolution of the issues here. So, I will permit the witness to testify and make a final evaluation with respect to how much weight to give to that testimony and how to weigh it in the entire case and we can go along. But it does appear that she is going to, she is, it is being offered on subjects that are pertinent to the overall issues in this litigation. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. Zia. Let's begin by having you tell the court a little about yourself. How old are you, Ms. Zia? I am 57 years old. Where did you grow up? In New Jersey. How long have you lived in California? Counsel, be sure to keep your voice up and the witness. Sure. How long have you lived in California? For about 18 years. How many siblings do you have? I have five siblings. Are any of them married? Four of them are married. Are your parents still alive? My mother is still living. And where does your mom live? 
My mom lives in the Bay Area. Where did you go to school? Went to high school at John F. Kennedy High School in New Jersey, and I went to college at Princeton University. Did you graduate? Yes, I did. And what degree did you earn? A Bachelor of Arts degree. And do you have any other degrees? I have an honorary Doctor of Law degree. From where? From the City University of New York School of Law. And what do you do? I'm a writer. Have you written any books? I've written two and two books, and I've edited a number of publications. Can you briefly tell us a little bit about the two books that you've written? My first book is called Asian American Dreams, The Emergence of an American People. And it's a book about the con contemporary history of Asian, Asian Americans, particularly around civil rights matters and struggles, trials, and tribulations over the last, I'd say, 40 years. And your second book? My second book was about, was entitled My Country Versus Me, and was the story of the Chinese American scientist at Los Alamos National Labs, whose name is Wen Hong Li, who was falsely accused of being a spy for the People's Republic of China. And I co-authored that with him to tell his story. Have you ever worked for any publications? I've worked for a number of publications. What was the last publication that you worked for? The last one was Miss Magazine. And what was your position? When I left, I was executive editor. Ms. Zia, are you a lesbian? I am. How long have you been a lesbian? I think I've been a lesbian all my life. And when did you come out? A coming out is a process. And so there are a lot of ways to describe what coming out is. I think I first became aware that I was a lesbian when I was, or that I might be a lesbian, when I was in college, when I first learned the word lesbian. But there were a lot of experiences I had when I was younger, starting when I was even about six or seven years old, that I, I look back now and realize that there were clear signs of that I, what team I was on. <laughs> Uh, can you give an example? Uh, can you give an example of one of those experiences when you were very young? Well, when I was about six or seven or eight, I was just a school kid. You know, maybe I was in school and there was a neighbor lady or a couple of adults around who typically ask kids, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so she asked me, so do you want to get married when you grow up? In the kind of tone that would that the expectation, that the answer should be yes. And I was just a kid, but I immediately said, no, I don't want to get married. And I remember this because she was really surprised that, you know, here I was a little girl and I, you know, was so definite and emphatic that I did, didn't want to get married. And it was very clear to me, even at that time, that I really couldn't imagine getting married married to a man it was just not in my in my world view or imagination and you mentioned that you were first aware that you might be a lesbian when you were in college when did you actually come out well i guess the clearest way to say that is i had my first relationship with a woman in the mid 1980s when i was in my 30s and how much after that was when you were in college that would have been about 12 years, 10, 12 years after college. Why did it take so long between college and your first relationship with a woman? There were many, I guess I would say, uh, social pressures to, to, to steer me away from the person I really was f to, for me not to be a lesbian. Can you give me an example? Well, I actually had an incident that I can think of as a lesbian trial, where after I had left college, I had for a time attended medical school. And I quit medical school and realized that I wanted to spend more of my time do doing community organizing like our president. And so I was involved in my neighborhood in Boston, doing a lot of community work, community organizing work in this particular time around ending discrimination in the construction trades for federally funded projects, which at the time didn't hire women. 
they didn't hire people of color at all. They were very restrictive, but very high paying jobs. So I was involved with a lot of people in my neighborhood, community groups, especially in an Asian, an Asian community organization and an African American community organization. We were working together to do this kind of anti-discrimination work. And one day I was called to a meeting and I didn't know the purpose of the meeting except that there was a meeting. And when I got to the meeting, there was a group of people, all of my friends, all these people in the community groups that I looked at as my family, my community. We worked hard together with each other for these causes. And they told, they were sitting in a semicircle and they asked me to sit down in the middle of the circle. And at the time when I was doing this community work, I was also involved in a lot of women's organizing. There was a very active movement in women's movement in Boston as well. And I was involved in that. And so they called me to the meeting knowing that I did this work in the women's movement, you know, and they said, so sit here. We want to ask you some questions. We've noticed that you seem to be working a lot with women and you seem to be working with a lot of lesbians. And you know, in our communities of color, uh, the Asian American community there, we don't have homosexuals in our community. And it would be really terrible to have somebody who was a homosexual, a lesbian, working with us. Because it would, because homosexuality is a symptom of white, of white petty bourgeois, petty bourgeois decadence. And so we really wouldn't want you, want to have you with us, working with us on these causes if you are a lesbian. And the leader of the African American group said very similar things that homosexuality is not something they could accept in the African American community. And after they laid out these things, as I sat in front of my friends, my community, people I considered my extended family, they laid that out and then they said, so Helen, tell us, are you a lesbian? And I was about 23 then, and I sat there looking at the people that I trusted in this world, asking me that. And I had friends who were indeed lesbians, and I didn't know how to first answer that question. It was, are you a lesbian? What would make me a lesbian? I knew that I had lesbian thoughts, whatever those are that I had had attractions to women, but I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have a membership card that said that I was a lesbian. I didn't get a toaster oven or a congratulatory message saying, welcome to lesbianhood. <laughs> and so, but there they were all staring at me, the people I trusted. And Helen, are you a lesbian? So I said, no, I'm not. And that made them happy. And for me, it was, it was, that was the end for them. The meeting disbanded, the trial was over, and for me, it was that I had stepped into the closet and slammed the, sh the door shut. Did you do anything else in response to the lesbian trial? I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Did you do anything else in response to the lesbian trial? You mentioned you stepped in the closet and slammed the door. Is there anything specific that you did? Well, I got the message very clearly that the thought I might be a lesbian and that doing work with other women in women's movement and having friends who were lesbians was something that was unacceptable. And so having said that I was not a lesbian and stepping right into the closet, I stopped seeing my friends. I cut off my ties with my dear friends in the women's movement there in Boston. I stopped going to meetings. I'd been involved in a leadership capacity. I stopped completely. I really shut the door. Did you also used to have diaries? Yes. Did you do anything to those diaries after the lesbian trial? I am a writer today, but I think I started that a long time ago, even before I realized I would become a writer. And I was an avid journal keeper. I wrote diaries from the time I was quite young. And after my lesbian trial, I knew that I had explored the thought, I had written down thoughts that maybe I was a lesbian. I find so-and-so to be attractive. I have these feelings. And so shortly after the, this trial, I was going to move 
I was going to move from Boston to Detroit and I was going to pack up my little car with all my small number of worldly, worldly possessions. And then there came a question of what do I do with these diaries? And I was I became so concerned that what if I was driving on the highway and I'd gone into a car accident and I was killed? And there are my diaries that say, I think I might be a lesbian. I took my diaries, which at the time was probably more than 10 years worth of diaries. And I went out to a field nearby, a construction site where there was a barrel. I put them in and I lit them up and I burned my diaries. Mazia, have you ever experienced any discrimination relating to your work due to your sexual orientation? Related to my work? Yes. Yes, on a few occasions. Can you provide an example? Well, there was a time when I was invited to give a speech. I do some lecturing and I was invited to give a speech to Notre Dame University and it was in the 1990s, early 1990s, when there was a lot of anti-gay campaigns going on. And the person who invited me was aware that I was a lesbian. So one day after I got the invitation that she had extended to me, she asked me, by the way, are you going to say anything about sexual orientation or about being a lesbian? And I hadn't really thought much about what I was going to say yet, but I said, well, I'm not sure, but now that you asked me, I might. And she said, well, in that case, I don't think you should come. And she rescinded the invitation. So that was one incident. Have you ever experienced any um, have you ever experienced any discrimination from family members due to your sexual orientation? Yes, I have. When when I came out to well, when I was delivering a lecture in the New York area, I have a cousin out there and he was very interested in the books I had written. He was very interested in hearing my lecture. He came to my lecture. And in my lecture I talked about being a lesbian and I talked about the discrimination that's faced by people of color, by lesbians, and the fact that I, that I was a lesbian. And it was a very small part of my, my lecture, but after that he completely cut off all ties. I had even made attempts to contact him when I was going to be visiting New York, but he never, has never returned a single phone call or message since then. Ms. Zia, do you ever feel physically threatened because of your sexual orientation? I feel constantly aware that my sexual orientation could, for whatever reason, provoke violence toward me or toward my loved ones. And so I do feel that I, as I walk through life, as I go through streets of San Francisco or anywhere else, especially when I am with my, my wife, that we... I feel very aware of whether we express our affection towards each other publicly, have any public displays of affection, whether we hold hands in public where we, where that might be. And my spouse is very affectionate. There are often times if we go to the movies or go to have dinner, like any other committed married couple, there might be a time where you would want to put your arm around the other and just hold each other, hug each other. And Leah is very inclined to do that. And I feel there are a lot of times when I have to, I do actually push her away and say, look where we are, we have to be careful. And even within our own neighborhood, I feel alert. I feel, and I feel bad about that, but I feel very conscious that there are people who hate us and just for who we are, and that we have to be careful about that. Messia, do you remember the Proposition 8 campaign? Yes, I do. Did you encounter any discrimination during that campaign? Yes, I did. Can you describe some? Well, I guess I would begin with the very notion of a campa campaign that would degrade and devalue the marriage that I have with my wife, the most important person in my life. And to see the the ads and the misinformation and the deceptive kind of things that are said about us. I, I would say that I, I feel that that's highly discriminatory. To have read or experienced people saying to me, coming up to me 
and making slurs, calling me names, telling me that I'm an abomination, that my marriage to Leah and other people like us, people have said, when we were working on the Prop 8 campaign, the effort to, we had worked on the campaign to, to try to get people to vote no on Proposition 8. And when we would be out on the streets of San Francisco in Oakland handing out flyers, people would just come up to us and say, you know, you dyke and excuse my language, your honor, but you fucking dyke or you're going to die and burn in hell. You're an abomination. And to read the materials and to see the kind of things that have been put out there about us, like our marriage, our existence, my marriage to Leah is going to cause people to have sex with animals, to contribute to bestiality in society, or that my marriage to Leah is going to, I guess, cause them to marry many other people, marry other people so that there will be more polygamy in society, or that my marriage to Leah is going to cause great harm to their children and lead to the molestation of children, and that my marriage to Leah is going to cause the end of the human race. And while we were handing out flyers, dozens of people, separate people in separate locations, separate times in different cities would look at the flyer, laugh, or just look at us or say something with the most derisive kind of expression and say, no more people. With this, no more people, no more human race that we such abominations would be the cause of the end of the human race. And to me, these were all highly discriminatory because in essence, they're saying that we are so offensive, that we are so not worthy of being human beings, of having the full rights and equality that every other human being, heterosexual human being can enjoy just to be married to each other, that we would be the cause of the end of the human race. And if we were to cause all of these things, then we would be, what do you do when somebody is going to end the human race and cause great, great harm to your children and cause all this terrible stuff? Well, you're going to want to stamp them out. And to me, that was a highly painful and discriminatory and hurtful message that I I also felt endangered us as well. Mazia, uh, if you could turn to the binder in front of you, and it's PX2119. Can you take a quick look at it? Yes. Your Honor, object. This was not one of the documents that was identified as an exhibit that was used in connection with Ms. Zia. Your Honor, uh, we disclosed this exhibit on Wednesday and we alerted them. It's now Friday. They have had it for 48 hours. I don't see any prejudice to this. They have had plenty of time to take a look at it and observe it. All right. As long as it was disclosed prior to the witness's testimony and in accordance with the standing order that we've given in this case, this will be fine. You may present the exhibit to the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you recognize this exhibit? Yes, I do. Can you tell me what it is? It is one of the pages from a website called One Man, One Woman. When did you first see this page? I saw this website and this page during a Yes on 8 campaign. Objection, Your Honor. The document does not appear to be a document that was put out by protectmarriage.com. And as we've indicated earlier, those documents have been excluded already. You as can documents. take that up on cross-examination, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you read the, I guess, the first sentence in red? Homosexuality is homosexuality linked to pedophilia. Then can you read the next sentence below that? Studies show that homosexuality is linked to pedophilia and then there is a dot 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 and more, a link to more of that. And you recently, just a few minutes ago, you described basically these types of messages that you found offensive and hurtful. Is this an example of one of those? Yes, this is one of those. Your Honor, I would like to move this into evidence. Objection, Your Honor. I'm sorry I missed the number of the document. 
is PX2199. There's no indication that this, there's, there's any foundation for this document. As I've indicated a moment ago, it's not an official campaign document from protectmarriage.com. It's highly prejudicial if it's associated with the campaign as an official document, and it should be excluded. All right. You made your objection, your 403 objection. I'll reserve until you're cross. Thank you, Your Honor. Mizia, you've mentioned that you're married. What's your wife's name? Her name is Leah Shigemura. And before you married, I'm going to call her Leah. Had you been married before? No. Can you tell me a little bit about how you feel about Leah? I feel that Leah is my soulmate in life. I love her. I, she's the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. She's the most important person to me. When did you first meet Leah? I first met Leah in 1983 here in San Francisco. I was living in Detroit at the time and we were both involved in a civil rights campaign that revolved around the hate crime against Chinese American man in Detroit named Vincent Chen. And I was in Detroit, part of that campaign. And we came to San Francisco as a part of the educational piece of that campaign. And Leah was on the organizing committee here in San Francisco. When did you and Leah start dating? We didn't start dating until many years after that, about uh, 1992. And when you started dating, uh, where were the two of you living? Leah was still here in San Francisco and I was in New York at the time. And did you eventually decide to get together in the same area? Yes. And I assume one of you moved? Yes, I moved out here. When you moved, did you give anything up when you moved to San Francisco from New York? Um, well, I had been born and raised in New Jersey. I was an East Coast person, so I left the East Coast. But I was well entrenched, I guess I'd say, in my journalism career, I was at Miss Magazine, I was an executive editor, and I was in the succession to be the editor-in-chief of Miss Magazine at the time. And then I met Leah, and Miss Magazine, the job I had, was really the job I had always wanted. It was, it was where I wanted to be. But when I met Leah, I knew that this was the woman I wanted to be with. This was the person I wanted to be with all my life. And so there was really no decision to make. I, I left New York, the East Coast, the home I had, but I left the job that I had always wanted. Have you and Leah ever registered as domestic partners? Yes. When did you first register as a domestic partner? Um, we registered as domestic partners first in the city of San Francisco in 1993, shortly after I moved here with Leah. Can you describe the process of registering for a domestic partner at that time? Yes, it was actually a, um, a little anticlimactic. We were excited about being able to register as domestic partners. We came to City Hall. We went to a window that I would describe as a it's kind of an all-purpose postal window kind of thing where I think they issued dog licenses as well as domestic partner licenses. <laughs> and uh, how did that process make you feel? I left feeling a little like, so this is, this is domestic partnership. We walked away with a little certificate, the kind that a kid gets for the perfect attendance of the week. And so it was just a little certificate like that, you know, we still valued and we put in a frame but it didn't feel like it didn't feel like much at all it wasn't the kind of thing we sent notice out to friends about or sent invitations to a party or anything you didn't have any celebration no not at all did you did you later register as a domestic partner with the state of california yes we did when state domestic partnerships became available in i guess 2003 we filed for domestic partnership again with the state. Can you describe that process, please? Well, there was no dog license window at the time. Uh, instead, we downloaded the form from the internet, filled it out, got it notarized and mailed it in. And that was it. And did you get something back in the mail? 
We got another form back in the mail, and it said, you are now domestic partners in the state of California. And did you hold a celebration? No, not at all. It was, getting that form in the mail was not, not an occasion to write home about. So you mentioned that you were married. Uh, when did you first get married to Leah? We got married in 2004 during the President's Day, Valentine's Day weekend, the first moment that we could when marriages became available to same-sex couples. Can you describe how you decided to get married? Well, at first we weren't sure that what we were seeing in the news was real. And we talked to each other. We said, what? Look at this. Is this real? And we thought about it, about, okay, should we get married? But we would want our family around us, with us, if we were going to get married. Your dad is in Honolulu. He's pretty elderly. My mother is also quite elderly. And I thought, well, all those people have to stand for eight hours in the rain. I don't think we can subject our parents to this. And then I got a phone call from my mother who said, Helen, I saw on the news couples can get married. You and Leah can get married now. Why don't you get married? And that was mom. So that was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then there was just the logistical question about everything was happening so quickly. How would we, how would we manage this? We had friends who were working in the city, the San Francisco city assessor recorder's office who were actually in charge of getting the marriage licenses done, getting the process done. And they were looking for volunteers. They were looking for people to help process these thousands of couples who were applying to get married. And they asked if, if we could volunteer. Leah and I both know how to type and file and do those kind of things. So we said, sure, we'll come in. We'll come in and help. So we came in on, I believe it was Monday, President's Day, and it was a, you know, government holiday, but the office was kept open through the volunteers. And we were there and typed and filed for about, I think, about eight hours. And the line was all the way around the block. And at the end of the day, after we had typed all these people, and I was in the process before Leah, so I was typing people's applications as they were coming in, and she was later doing on doing something else and I was done they had closed the line it was almost you know five o'clock or whatever time they were going to close and so I looked at Leah and I said should I type out an application for us would you marry me <laughs> and Leah said I can't talk right now I'm busy <laughs> I'm still filing these people's things very responsible of her yes she <laughs> took her responsibilities very seriously and so while she was still processing other couples to get married, I was there with the, you know, the word processor, and I filled out the form for us. I put her name and all, put in all the information and uh, put my name in all the information. And then I had the form and I took it over to her and I said, here's a marriage license. Would you marry me? And she said, okay. And so there we were, probably one of the last couples of the whole day after everybody else had been processed. The people who had waited in line for eight hours were done. And then... Then we went ahead and had witnesses and had a, had a justice of the peace marriage ceremony. Did you celebrate at some point? We did. It was then after we had our marriage licenses and it was, we were married. <laughs> well, okay. Then we started talking about like any other couple, what kind of, how are we going to celebrate this? And we decided that we wanted to have a big wedding reception a wedding reception like every other couple would have with a wedding banquet. We issued wedding invitations, had them printed up, you know, with all the little envelopes and things like that. Drew up a list, had all the kind of discussions and even a few arguments about what kind of music are we going to play? You know, where will we go? How much are we going to spend? What date? We picked a date in August for our wedding party, August 20th and sent the invitations out to 150, 200 people and did all the kind of things to prepare for a big wedding party. How many people attended your wedding? About 150. And did your families attend? Our, our families, our wonderful, loving and supportive families came from all over the United States. Leah grew up in Hawaii in Honolulu. I grew up in the East Coast. So we actually had friends and family coming from the entire span of America. 
from all the way from East Coast to Hawaii flew in to come to our, our, our marriage, our wedding party, our wedding celebration. And we planned also to have an affirmation ceremony there. Leah's dad, who at the time was, at the time was 86 years old, Leah's dad was a retired judge in the state of Hawaii. And so he came, he brought his judge's robes and he was going to officiate with an affirmation ceremony at our wedding banquet. Can you turn to your exhibit binder, uh, PX600? Do you recognize that picture? Yes, I do. What is the picture of? It's a picture of one of our family groupings at our wedding reception, wedding banquet. And this is a picture of my mother, my siblings, and some of their children. Your Honor, I would like to move this into evidence. Very well, 600 is admitted. Did your marriage later get invalidated? My marriage? The first one. My marriage was not later. My marriage was invalidated about a week before our wedding reception. And how did that make you feel? Leigh and I were devastated. We felt sad. We felt, we grieved. We felt pretty horrible that our, our marriage that made us so happy and brought us so much joy made us made such happiness within our families was suddenly rendered invalid. And we felt that it wasn't just a statement that our marriages were invalidated. We felt that our relationship was invalidated. We felt that we as human beings had suddenly become invalidated and we felt pretty awful. Did you and Leah later get married again? We did. And when was that? In June of 2008, as soon as that opportunity became available. Now, Mazia, how has getting married changed things for you? Getting married has made changes in so many multiple, multitude of ways, tangible and intangible in our lives that we are even discovering new ways every day. But in the most immediate sense, it was in how our families related to us. And so when we first got married in 2004 and had our wedding party, we have, we have a niece who was two years old when Lee and I got together. She's my brother's daughter. And she has only known Leah and me as Auntie Helen and Auntie Leah. She has only known us together. And she was about 15 or 16 when we had the wedding party. And in this exhibit, she's standing there, standing here, she came to celebrate with us. And when she got off the plane and she came and saw Leah and me, it was the first time she really saw us after our wedding vows at City Hall. She came over and gave us a big hug, gave Leah a hug and said, Auntie Leah, now you're really my auntie. And here we were. I was a little surprised at that because I thought, well, you've only known her as your auntie. She's always been your auntie. But then I could see from her little child and teenager point of view that somehow us being officially married made a difference to her and that Leah was now really her auntie. It made a difference to our parents, to how parents, our parents related to us. It made a difference to how we related to people. Because when you say you're a domestic partner, people, you know, Leah and I spend a lot of time with each other. We go to social engagements with each other. We go to work engagements in the world. And people say, well, who's this person who seems to be hanging on to you awfully close? And if I say, oh, she's my partner, I can't count the number of times people say, oh, partner, partner in what business? And Leah and I got used to having to answer, to have an answer to that, to say, well, we're partners in life. And then we just get used to watching the look on their faces to see whether they got it. And often it would just be this look of bewilderment. Oh, what? business is life. Do you mean life insurance? <laughs> and for our parents, not, and for our families, you know, marriage is not just about us and our relationship. It's a matter of how our families also relate to people. You know, for me to show up at every family event in Leah's family, every kind of social engagement in her family, people ask, well, who, who is she? You know, who is this? 
And for her parents or for her 94-year-old auntie to say, well, this is Helen's friend. Well, she must be a really good friend because she's been coming to these events for the last 17 years. She's a really good friend. But friend didn't quite capture it. Partner, they never got. They never said, oh, Helen is Leah's partner. And suddenly they were able to say, Helen is my daughter-in-law. My mother, I would watch, my mother is an immigrant from China. Her English is her second language. She really doesn't get what partner is. I would be around her and her friends who would look at Leah and I could hear them say, sometimes in English, sometimes in Chinese, who's she? You know, and my mother, before we would marry, would struggle and just say, she's Helen's friend. And then it changed. And she would say, this is Helen's, this is my daughter-in-law. And they would get it. And whether they approved or disapproved, it didn't matter, they got it. It's like you don't insult somebody's wife. You don't insult somebody's mother. She's clearly saying, this is my wife, that's it. End of story. There's no questions, wife and what, spouses and what. We're not partners in life or in some business. And so it changed things on a very huge level like that. And beyond that, I would say marriage and how it affected our families was not just about us and how people related to us. Our families related to each other differently because, because marriage is, and I'm beginning to understand what I've always read, Marriage is the joining of two families. So my family and Leah's family now relate to each other differently. My mother is the in-law to Leah's side of the family. Leah's father became an in-law to my brother who lived about five minutes away from Leah's father while he was still alive. And in those 15 years before we were married, that my brother lived near my, my father-in-law, they didn't really make an effort to see each other. After we married, my father-in-law, Leah's father, actually would stop by my brother's house, stop by and drop things off. You know, fruit that was growing in his yard and things like that. My brother is quite active in Hawaii. Leah's, and so please bear with me as I describe the relationship, Leah's brother's wife, my sister-in-law, has a sister who runs the same circle as my mother, my brother. Okay, extended family. They see each other as in-laws now. When they are at a public event, they will go and my brother will say, this is my in-law. You know, this is Candy, she's related to me. And people will say, how? And then he will explain, she's, you know, my sister and her sister-in-law are married to each other. And then they wait to look and see, you know, whether people understand that, but the message is that they're family. And so our families relate differently to each other. Leah's dad has a terminal, had a terminal illness. He was in hospice not long ago. He just passed away not even two months ago. When he was in the hospital, in hospice care, Leah and I went to the hospital and were at his side quite a lot. And of course, the other hospital workers, it's like, who, who comes to hospice care? It's the closest immediate family members. They're the ones who are there around the clock. And they would say to Leah's dad, who was not doing well, who are these? Are these your daughters? And Leah's dad said from his, his hospital bed, this is my daughter and this is my favorite daughter-in-law. And so it was like, Leah said, he said daughter-in-law and I said, he said favorite. <laughs> But it was a way that even in being so ill, he could describe who we were. And so that was a difference. That was a difference it made. And in the important events in life, which I guess if we were summarized, we summarize our lives and we say birth, our lifetime partner, creating our own family in death. When it was time for Leah's dad's funeral, that's when the family comes together. That's when you put out an obituary and you say, who was in the family? When you lay out the memorial service hall and you say who sits here and who sits here and who has what role and the members of the immediate family are there in the closest circle and there was no question that I was Leah's wife and that I was a member of the family and there was no ambiguity about it and I wasn't some partner in business or partner in life, I was her spouse. And I was right there with the first row in the family. 
and I had my responsibilities as well as being a member of the family. And so in those important, most important moments in our lives, marriage made it very clear that I was family, that we are family and we, where we stand. Thank you, Ms. Ian. I have nothing further. Very well. Mr. Raum, you may cross-examine. 